Hello, hello, hello. Uh, welcome once again to this live show where we interview amazing guests uh, who have great stories to tell. So today, I'm privileged to have in the studio Dr. Robin Omeka, who is the coordinator of the Anika Initiative. So he's going to share with us about uh, the, the work that they do. And uh, I hope that you're all going to learn and be inspired by Anika Initiative. So welcome to the studio. Let me add him. Welcome to the studio, Dr. Robin. Omeka, yes. how are yes. you? <laughs> I am very well, Dr. Violet. How are you? I'm very, very much well. So kindly introduce yourself uh, to the viewers so that they can get to learn more about who, first of all, is Dr. Robin Omeka. And then thereafter, you can share with us about the Anika Initiative. Over to you. Ah, OK. So uh, <laughs> Dr. Robin Omeka is many things, yeah? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, but I am, I am professionally, I am trained as a natural resource manager, um, which I will be getting a bit into and why there's a huge uh, difference between that and what I do. Um, I am also a trained intellectual property expert from Harvard Law. I am also... <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. Oh my God! Yeah, so I'm I'm also averse with um, business entrepreneurship, the business model canvas, human centered design, and I am also an artist. Yeah, so uh, all of these things come together to form the person who is Robin Omeka, who is for the purposes of this meeting. Uh, the co-founder and the current coordinator for the Anika Initiative. Yeah, mm -hmm. so I believe that answers the first question. And the next question was, what is the Anika Initiative? Yes, exactly. Oh, okay. So the Anika Initiative is a, is a creative think tank of people practicing in the creative field. So we are ideally a collective of... Um, spoken word artists, project managers, and uh, people who are leading conversations and campaigns in causes uh, in the fields of climate action, in the fields of democracy, in the fields of artistic expression, in the fields of youth and migration, where some of our biggest and most formidable work um, is recognized mostly with refugees in urban settlements. You know, as well as working with artistic collectives, both in the country and outside the country, as far down as South Africa and as far upwards as West Africa in Ghana and Nigeria. Um, Anika Initiative started as a passion project between seven individuals who had artistic uh, tendencies. Most of us who are spoken word artists, we still are. I am myself a spoken word artist. I perform under the stage name Enigma Creative. That's creative with a K. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but then we started out as artists who just wanted to leverage the power of artistic expression to, to champion for conversations that build experiences in society. Initially, uh, we wanted to to have a, a round of conversations aimed at uh, targeting the whole concept of gender-based violence because circa 2015, it was an emerging big issue, particularly on digital platforms. If you recall, this was maybe a year or two before we had the whole Me Too movement coming from the States and becoming a huge wave that moved around the world. Yeah? So there was a lot of need for us to, to create a platform where young people could come and, you know, tell their stories or share their experiences. 
and ultimately get helped through psychosocial support, finding uh, opportunities for them to be counseled uh, using uh, partnerships that we had at the time that we have since grown, uh, you know. So at the time, we just wanted to use art to discuss issues. But then over the years, we have, we have gracefully grown uh, to become an organization that is leading capacity building uh, for both artist, people with artistic tendencies. Uh, so those are poets, musicians, uh, craftspeople, painters, photographers, videographers, filmmakers, anything with an artistic leaning. Uh, we have also grown to, to find spaces for artistic expression uh, to be sort of plugged into uh, the whole tapestry of forming solutions for issues such as youth and migration, uh, for issues in climate action, for issues in gender-based violence, for issues in policy, youth and governance. Ultimately, our 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 mantra as an initiative is that artistic expression is entertainment is a byproduct of artistic expression you know when artists come on stage and they do what they do on stage that you are entertained is a byproduct of the process in fact a huge deliverable of the artistic expression cycle is that you are, in, you are educated, you are informed, and you become a more cultured person because of the work of artists. And so as an initiative, we strive to build these particular interests um, and strengths that we feel artistic expression has. When we, we have, uh, as, an, as an initiative, we have, we have, we have organized um, cultural exchanges um, for artists in Kenya, artists in Rwanda. We've had artists coming from South Africa to Kenya. We've had artists coming from Kenya to Uganda, then through Rwanda, then to Burundi and back. And one thing cuts across. The young people in, this, in Africa as a continent have literally the same issues, literally the same issues. Say, for instance, the only thing that is uh, creating a, a difference between us is things like cultural, uh, like, uh, like language dispositions, uh, whereby we have language barriers. Uh, things like, for instance, different political dispensations, different uh, opportunities accorded to different people in different countries. But generally, our challenges are the same, whether it's gender-based violence, whether it's the need for capital to start businesses and grow them, whether it's the need for quality education, whether it's the need for platforms to understand how our political structures work. Generally, we are, saving, we are experiencing the same problems. And I've learned through the work we do at the Anika Initiative over the past few years that finding opportunities for artists to meet artists, young people, people in civil society to meet allows us to then have um, a, a, a united front that allows us to put all these problems into context, account for a different contextual experiences, but then come up with a solution that works for us all. Yeah, I went on a tangent for nine minutes, but back to you. Okay. That's okay, that's okay. So um, now I'd like us now to get into details so that now we, we, can, we can understand uh, the Anika initiative uh, more. And yes. at least you can also like, uh, so we are going to touch on the different aspects that you are engaged in, and then you can also share on, uh, on even the partners or even the donors who have supported you in those, in those courses and or the partners you have worked with. So mm. we'd like uh, first to look at uh, youth and migration. Kindly share about the Anika initiative and what it's doing, what it's doing uh, with regards to youth and migration, and mm. whether you you've engaged outside Kenya or just share, even if it's refugee camps, whatever. Just we are here to learn and learn more from you. Yeah. So um, 
youth and migration is one of the thematic areas that are housed under the Anika initiative. Mm. And um, it squarely focuses on the and particularly refugees in urban settlements. Mm. So uh, many people don't understand that uh, in Kenya, for instance, uh, the refugee population in total, for those who are in the camps and around, and those in urban settlements, it totals to around uh, slightly under 600,000 or slightly more than 600,000 uh, refugees. Now, more than 200,000 of these refugees are housed in urban settlements. So that's why you'll hear people saying, for instance, oh, there are so many uh, South Sudanese in Kasarani, there are so many Rwandese in Kitengela, there are so many Congolese in Kawangware. You know, these are refugees with, with, uh, with verifiable documents to settle in these places. And probably before I go into the work we do, it's important, I feel, for people to understand the context that allows uh, these refugees uh, to be housed in these places. So, uh, for example, from conflicts um, around their home areas to coming into the camps, you know, different refugees have different needs. Um, some came into the country when they were just about to get into college, you know, and uh, some have been exiled for reasons such as, you know, their sexual and gender identity, which means that even at the camps, they are not safe. So they need an extra layer of cautioning because they, they're experiencing the same persecution in the camps that they will be experiencing at home, which they were running away from. Yeah, so all these different contextual issues form the basis of why we have refugees settled in camps and refugees settled in urban settlements. Now, refugees settled in camps have the benefit of uh, a community that is uh, not too far removed from their own individual experiences. Mm -hmm. When you live in a camp as a refugee, you are most likely surrounded by refugees who have had either a worse experience than yours or an experience as close to yours as possible. This means that there are areas of convergence that you can use to build, you know, intimacy at a societal level that allows you to move forward together. Now, refugees in urban settlements face a, a very different set of, of variables. One, you are living in a city like Nairobi that is considerably very expensive. Uh, you are living in a city where the, 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 overbearing, the overbearing assumption is that as a refugee, you are supported in dollars and there are donor organizations that give you a lot of money that allows you to live, which is not true. In my lived experience working with refugees, that's not the case. So our youth and migration docket at the Anika Initiative uh, focuses squarely on exposing most of the lived experiences of these urban refugees. We try as much as possible to find opportunities for urban refugees uh, to get civically engaged with host communities, Mukenya wa kawaida, ajuane na wao, so that you can get to understand them beyond the stereotype of them being a statistic. Want you to understand where they come from, why they need help. Want you to understand first and foremost that these are human beings just like yourself. These are people who are coming from homes that were middle-income families, that could support themselves, they had cars, they had jobs, they had a thriving uh, socioeconomic status, and then whatever happened to them was not out of choice. It's important for Kenyans to understand that the refugee status is something that can be accorded a Kenyan. You know, we, we are not removed from the reality of that possibility. And so it's important to attach our humanity uh, when we are handling or dealing with refugees. So our intervention basically focuses on building the civic engagement um, capacity of host communities to understand mm. better the plight of refugees and more mm. so to expand the civic, the civic space available to urban refugees so that they can begin to, you know, create meaningful connections and, you know, hopefully build something that, you know, surpasses their refugee status. 
Mm-hmm. How we have done this is again because Anika Initiative is a creative think tank, which means a lot of our work focuses on how we can use artistic expression and dialogue to build consensus on issues. So a lot of what we do around this thematic area involves how do we expose the culture of these refugees to host communities? How do we mm-hmm. share our artistic expression as Kenyans and Africans with, with the artistic expression of these refugees? What mm-hmm. stories exist in the communities where these refugees come from that are opportunities for us as Kenyans with the privilege of our citizenship and the upper hand we have to extend a helping hand, what opportunities exist for us to, to, you know, to champion for inclusivity? Uh, Of course, without, without, um, without creating the, the, the strife that comes with the assumption that, you know, these refugees come in, they take away our resources, they take away our jobs, you know, so, so we, we try as much as possible to find different ways to, to traverse that particular, that particular path. And um, based off of that context alone, the one I've explained in the few minutes yeah. <laughs> or many minutes, Dr. Violet, you've given me, is um, we've been able to build conversations between uh, refugees and civil society organizations and government agencies and host communities over the past three years. So in 2019, in 2020, and in 2021, with 2021 being uh, the most, um, I'd say, expanded intervention we've had within the youth and migration uh, docket, where we had uh, a 16 series podcast, Mm. a 16 podcast series uh, that, that basically broke down uh, you know, the lives of refugees into topics such as mental health and awareness, topics such as sexual and gender identity, topics such as uh, peace and security, policy and governance, education in emergencies, you know, things like livelihoods. You know, these are these are really important issues for refugees. And so uh, we, we determined from previous interventions that uh, refugees rarely have an opportunity to engage all stakeholders that they experience at one table. So, for example, a refugee who has an issue with education will most likely either talk uh, to an organization that deals specifically with education. Mm -hmm. A refugee who has an issue with registration or their documentation will, will only get to interact with, you know, the Refugee Affairs Secretariat, which is a government agency. A refugee with an issue on health and, and, and well-being will most likely only talk to an, a, a, a civil society organization that deals with health, you know, Akina Hayas and the rest. You know, but rarely do these people come together in one table and have an opportunity to share their experiences amongst each other so that they can build on the overlaps and have a, a united conversation that allows them to to come up with a solution that better attaches itself to the pains and the joys of refugees. And so that was, that was the backdrop Mm -hmm. of the 2021, you know, podcast series where we had uh, a a representative from the refugee community. We had a representative from a CSO organization. We had a representative from, um, from a government agency or a policy agency, agencies like Kituo Chasheria, a refugee, uh, um, RCK, Refugee Consortium of Kenya, IRC, the, Refu- the, the Rescue Committee, you know, organizations like Windle Trust, organizations like the Jesuit Missions, uh, Jesuit, Jesuit Mission, you know, bringing all these people together to have one discussion so that the, the narrative is aligned, so that you don't hear one story from one end and then you mm-hmm. hear another one from the other. That has mm-hmm. been basically our focus so far. Mm. All right. So thank you for sharing about uh, your work on youth and migration. So I'd like us now, now to, uh, to look at artistic collectives. Yes. Can you share, elaborate more on the artistic collective? Ah, okay. So 
the Anika Initiative is registered as an association, which okay. basically means we 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 have the ability to we absorb members and we program our programs depending on what the members needs are mm. uh, but then of course with the set parameters for our thematic areas as an association and uh, now um, when we talk about artistic collectives these include um, groupings of people who have artistic tendencies who have come together uh, to form some sort of community around themselves expressing you know the artistic uh, the artistic um, forms of expression so um, we do not group artistic collectives based on which type of art you perform rather we prefer artistic collectives to be a community of a number of artists doing different things so in uh, in in one artistic collective that we that is part of our association uh, in Kigali Rwanda it's called Umut Artworks we have spoken mm. word artists, we have musicians, we have thespians, we have uh, instrumentalists, we have, you know, people in mime, we have people in theater, people in filming, people in photography, people in painting, you know, people in abstract art. We have people in doing artistic forms of expression that I, I, I don't even know how to call them because they are deep deeply rooted in their culture you know in the mm. rwandan culture and and things like that you know and so uh basically an artistic collective we, there's an artistic collective in kikuyu that we work with uh the collective that's run by 902 street it's in kikuyu artists know know the the collective in kikuyu there's there's an artistic collective called um called uh, huruma arts collective uh, we're exploring conversations with other artistic collectives in in places like Kariobangi, places like Kawangware, Kasarani, in South Africa, in Ghana, you know, in Burundi, in in Nigeria, in Sweden, even you know. So th these are conversations that um, that are ongoing, and the whole idea is as different people working in different spaces within the field of artistic expression. I believe we are only scratching the surface with the number of possibilities that we can unearth, you know, to come together and build conversations that empower young people. Um, I was telling, I, I don't know, we were talking with you a, a month or so ago and um, uh, you, you happened to share an opportunity on um, you know, understanding the budget process. Mm. I, I don't know whether I've ever told you this, but that was a defining moment for me because I got to understand that even with all the education I have myself individually and all the privilege that is accorded to me as an individual and all the opportunities that have been given to me, imagine I don't understand the budgeting process in Kenya. You know, so the question for me became, how much more do younger, less privileged people don't get the fact that budgeting is an issue? You know, and so and so, like um, the, as we speak right now, the Anika Initiative is is uh, is is coming up with a framework to build capacities of what you call the budget champions. Yeah, so essentially trying to find out um, what 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 opportunities are there to engage artists. Um, Sorry, my lights went out. What opportunities can are there? You continue. <laughs> what opportunities are there to engage artists um, to better understand the budgeting process, to better to better streamline their activities to champion for changes in their societies by holding the the duty bearers, you know, in their county governments accountable through the budgeting process. And I feel like that's a huge gap because. Artists are very talented. You know, the global market for artistic expression, for art itself, is $2.6 trillion, you know? And, yeah. that, and, and that's, a, that's an estimate for, from three years ago. You know, if you factor oh. in inflation, factor in 
uh, intellectual property factor in licensing factor in all these other things i'm sure that figure has gone up and you know and the richest artistic couple in the car in the world is you know beyonce and jay-z if, yeah if, if you, and they only they're only worth around three I think three billion dollars or something. I'm not sure, mm. but 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 that tells you there's a lot of potential, but we are not tapping into it because we are not as connected as we need to be to be able to engage, you know, uh, the value we have to offer from that front. And I think, you know, the, as many of us that can come together as possible, uh, then that will be that will really help us a lot. Yeah. So oh, yeah, wow. the, I think. That's just about it for, for artistic wow. collectives. Oh my. I'm, I'm so happy to learn that uh, out of the training that you uh, you got empowered on the budget making process, your organization is now creating a framework in place so that you can uh, disseminate further uh, the, 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 the knowledge to budget champions within uh, ANICA. So yes, I'm, been, I'm happy to hear that. We've been we've been uh, we've been studying some documents available on the IBP uh, yes. website, and yes, we, yes. We, we, we we it's something it's something that I know is in the cooking. Uh, we are also we are also coming up with a with a with a with a fellowship program called the Africa Africa for Sustainable, no Africa for Creative Economies Fellowship. I'm confusing it because we we currently have for Africa for Sustainable Development Fellowship going on in collaboration with uh, uh, with um, with oh, Anika is a partner in the in the in the fellowship alongside uh, the African Leadership University in Kigali Rwanda alongside Route 2030 alongside Smart Talk Cafe Development Coalition of Africa and then a host of other organizations. Uh, but then the idea is, you know, the biggest problem we have as African youth is we have all the frustration for all the things that are going wrong, but we don't have the commensurate knowledge to challenge the frustrations and grow the systems and structures that we need to grow. And so I mm -hmm. feel like um, it's important that we do the little we are doing and, you know, inspire others to do more. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So, so viewer, you had uh, Dr. Robin uh, mention IBP. Uh, I know some of you may not understand what are the full initials. So, uh, IBP Kenya refers to International Budget Partnership Kenya, and uh, and my organization, Violet Beauty Foundation, uh, partners is a partner of IBP Kenya, and uh, they are the ones who trained. Um, even me on the budget making process um, in, in conjunction with Uraia Trust. And as such, uh, I became a facilitator and uh, now started training budget champions, okay, and recruiting. So I'm happy that you've uh, trained uh, uh, Dr. Robin Omeka because even at the training, uh, he had three, there were three of them from Anika Initiative. Who had come to come and learn about the budget making? And you can see the way citizens are getting at, 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 um, are realizing the importance of the budget making process. So I'm happy to know that uh, your organization has taken it up and is moving forward. Um, uh, when you go to the IBP website, you'll find all the materials that they have published, and uh, you can even learn learn from them so um the other thing i'd like you to touch on is on matter um, uh youth and governance at anika initiative yes so um like i've already mentioned yeah uh youth and governance uh, particularly in, in kenya uh, our 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 feasibility studies of of what that thematic area involves in the country is has revealed to us that you know a lot of young people don't understand how to engage politicians we don't understand um 
we don't understand what it means for them to have the positions they have. Mm. Um, a big example I will ex- I, I will give um, for for the viewers is uh, if you check the last two election cycles, the ones that have run under the new constitution. Yeah. There's this new post that has been given. It's not necessarily a new post, but it's been given considerable weight from what it used to be in the previous constitution. And that's the post of the uh, the MCS, the member of the county assembly. Now, if you do your own background checks over the past two election cycles, 80% of all member of county assemblies have not come back to office. They have been kicked yes. out by the electorate. Yes. And, and what that tells you is previously people did not understand what roles their leaders had. Because right now, you know, and the conversations people used to kick MCS out of office uh, for, at the ballot is things like, we know this road was, we know this road is the MCS road. It's been four years. Why are you making it in the fifth year? You know? We know the amount of bursaries given is this and this amount of money. Your work is supposed to be like this, like this, like this. We know that this money was supposed to be given here, here, and here. And we can that you've not given it. So you're not working for us. For these reasons, we don't care who you are. We don't care which party you're coming from. We are kicking you out, you know? And that's the conversation that has been happening at the, at the, at the county assembly level. You know, because now, as an MCA, if you don't perform, you are the closest linkable person in the hierarchy of political power, down from the president all the way down to you. And so people are beginning to understand what it means for an MCA to work and what it means for an MCA to not work. Mm. Now, you will also notice that that particular wave has begun also at the top, at the presidential level, where politics at the presidential level has also become a, poli- a, po- a politics of, of issues. In the previous, in the past constitution um, or previous elections, we've had situations where if the person at the top is popular enough, they will just say so and so is enough for this seat and that's enough, you know? In, in the past two election cycles, if you've noticed, there are places where people at the top of the presidential race have, you know, have, have said so-and-so, sorry, so-and-so is enough. And then that person failed extremely badly, you know? And so like the, the political landscape, the governance landscape in Kenya is shifting at least from a point where the citizen and the electorate understand uh, what it means to be a duty bearer, you know? And, and so, so our, 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 our youth and governance, uh, sorry, our, 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 our democracy and governance thematic area focuses on, on trying to fast track that kind of awareness. Um, again, the tool of choice here is dialogue and artistic expression, because an artist can say in five minutes what an, a, a person in the electorate needs to learn or will take to learn in three years. Mm. And it can be a poem, it can be a song, but as long as it's relatable and it's broken down in a way that somebody can pick it up, it becomes passionately linked to what they believe in. And so that's why we consistently use artistic expression. The whole Mm. purpose of dialogue is we need to understand as young people in the country or in the continent, what opportunities do we have to have our thought processes questioned? You know, you can't read something from bloggers who have been paid to write specific things and assume that that is the truth. Mm. We, we, are, we are trying to create platforms where young people can come together, uh, essentially uh, talk about a topic. So for instance, we can talk about something as simple as women in leadership, and then we bring a formidable woman in leadership, a trailblazer. I believe the last time we had that particular conversation on women in leadership, 
we had brought uh, in Nerima Wako Ojiwa, who is the um, who was the, the the executive director for Siasa Place, which is another you know groundbreaking uh, political platform for young people. And so during that particular discussion, essentially we we ask the young people in attendance, what do you understand when we say it is it is right for women to lead. You know, and you know, people come there and, and we make it a safe space so that people can give their opinions. You know, we have men who say, but a woman, man, a woman can't lead me. And you know, and then the women and other men join in and then they query, but why do you think so? And then we, we, we end up breaking down all the different myths, 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 misconceptions and stereotypes attached to that particular thought process. You know, mm -hmm. and then now we we add value to the discussion by now. You know, allowing the, the the person we've called in to share their experiences based on what they have had uh, the people who have attended the dialogue say. So and and you know it it becomes a, a scenario where, as somebody invited to speak, you don't start with your presentation because you can prepare that and do it a number of times anywhere. But you see, it doesn't help if you prepare a presentation that is not contextualized to what people within that particular setting know or believe or understand. And so our dialogues are structured in such a way that you can share your experiences as somebody who is a trailblazer, but in the context of ad addressing you know, the issues that have been raised that are alarming or comforting or that need to be elaborated further, you know? Mm -hmm. And so we've done that through a dialogue platform that we, 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 we had for a while and then we, we put it on hold because of the COVID pandemic, but we're strategizing on how to bring it back. Uh, that was called um, the White Talks. White Talks, which means youth talks. Uh, and the youth talks was was uh, was a co conglomerate of the Anika initiative, which basically ran uh, the discussion. We packaged the discussion. We we structured how the artists would come in. We built the deliverables for the discussions. We handled the the pre analysis, the post mortem. Uh, we wrote reports for the same uh, for the same discussions. Then we had partners like YWCA, the Young Women Christian Association, which you know provided space, provided you know seats, provided us, provided us you know with uh, with networks in other places to seek other opportunities as young people. We had organizations like the Global Peace Movement, led by the Executive Director Daniel Juma. We had organizations uh, funding. Orga we had organizations like uh, Strategic Applications International. Uh, we had uh, Emerging Leaders Foundation. You see, these these are all actors within the space who are interested in building the understanding of governance in the country. And so, I feel like, as a young person in in Kenya today, the the future could only be brighter. You know, there's um. There's a lot of potential. There's a lot of opportunity to to amass, you know, a, a deep cultural understanding of 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 who we are, uh, what we need to do, uh, how we can do it, how we can hold the people we give particular opportunities to lead us accountable, and so it's it's a beautiful time to be alive. Wow! Awesome! Awesome! So. Um... Right now, the other thing that I'd like you to touch on is uh, climate, uh, climate action. But before that, mm -hmm. it's still the director, the executive director at uh, at Siasa Place. Yeah, she's still she's ah, still okay. there. Yeah, she's still there. So, um, with regard now to climate action, kindly elaborate um, the work Anika, Anika does with regard to it. Yeah, okay. So um I am I am I am a trained natural resource manager. Um and uh, over the years we have as a, as an initiative we have struggled with uh with uh with this particular thematic area because 
the the climate action space is massively fragmented there is it's such a big space that you need to adequately define uh, what your intervention involves so the biggest issue we've had with the climate action uh, um, thematic area is uh, accounting for what climate action issues readily or, 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 or are expressly present, you know, within, within Kenya as a, co as, as a country and within, um, within, uh, within the lived experiences of the members who form part of our association. And um, we have been able to like network uh, with, with players in the field, uh, people like the Kenya Wildlife Service, Unganisha Cultures. Uh, we've been able to talk to organizations like uh, the programming department of the East African Wildlife Society, uh, the Kobo Trust, among others. And you see, uh, we, we are only now starting to execute you know our 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 a more robust um, uh, framework for the climate action thematic area. But in all honesty, we haven't been able, we haven't had an opportunity to like uh, squarely close in on it. But to answer your question a bit better, I'd say the the climate action thematic area for the Anika Initiative, as we speak today is looking to focus on opportunities to build discussions around issues of uh, awareness on things like, you know, uh, carbon credits, things like carbon footprints, things like littering. Uh, for instance, uh, at the Anika Initiative, we have a policy on things like straws. So, and and you know and plastic cups so we only use um uh, we only use uh the the this these paper cups because they are made from recycled paper um and 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 paper straws and if you notice organizations like java have have gotten ahead yeah. you know they don't serve you uh, your coffee in plastic cups it's always paper cups they don't give you straws that are made of plastic they give you straws that are made of paper um, and maybe to give you a bit of a background on why why that is important some of the easiest things that we can do today that can help our environment years to come are abolishing the use of plastic straws as simple as that. If you can refuse to use a plastic straw, you have reduced massively the carbon footprint of plastic in the oceans. Because there are regions where the, the ocean currents converge within the, the wide seas and oceans. Yeah? And these places where these currents converge, a lot of plastic is brought in. And you know, and, and a lot of this plastic actually in turns tons, like thousands of kilos. Mm. It's purely just plastic straws, purely plastic straws. Like you can get a few tons of kilos of plastic from the ocean and it will all be plastic straws. So imagine what could happen if we could stop using plastic straws and use you know, recycled paper straws because recycled mm. paper will degrade and decompose and, you know, ultimately feed into the environment, you know, at some front. Um, in our climate action thematic area, we have been engaged under the, under, the, under the Africa for Sustainable Development Fellowship as partners. Um, in the Africa for Sustainable, Sustainable Development Fellowship, uh, we, we basically bring a collection of young leaders across the continent. Uh, the just concluded cohort was concluded two weeks ago. It had people from Nigeria, Ghana, Burundi, Namibia, Zambia, Rwanda, Kenya. There are so many countries represented. And the fellowship focuses on um, 
on on training the young leaders on the SDGs, so the 17 SDGs. Mm. And you know, among them is you know climate action. We have mm. reduced inequalities, we have things like you know, zero poverty, zero hunger, all of these things have very huge bearings on climate action. Mm. At the fellowship, we also train uh, the participants on human-centered design because at the heart of every SDG is the need to come up with solutions for real problems in society. And it mm. becomes very difficult to make solutions that people can resonate with if we do not make them in a way that responds to their pains and joys, which is why human-centered design or design thinking is a huge part, you know, of that mm. process. At the fellowship, we train, we train participants on circular economy. We train participants on, on, uh, on things like, you know, UN resolution documents, policy documents that enable them to be informed on, you know, the different protocols and interventions and conventions that different countries, you know, are treaty to and how they can leverage the treaty and policy framework to to build you know interventions that respond from a legal perspective to an international audience and to a mm. local audience and address the needs of people at their community level so mm. our climate action uh, thematic area has majorly focused on macro issues mm. at a continental level and mm. we are working on a framework or rather um a strategic plan currently to like bring it down down completely to so that there's a linkage between the work we do in climate action with members of our association and and friends of the association uh all the way upwards to partners we work with you know at a continental level on discussions on on what things like circular economy looks like things like bamboo propagation you know, for example, bamboo, 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 rich people are planting bamboo in their farms right now for a reason, you know. Mm. Bamboo, bamboo is, bamboo takes up 35% more of the carbon in the atmosphere than any other tree. It mm. takes only three years to mature. It is one of the hardest wood you can find at the cheapest mm. cost. You mm. know, bamboo is used to make furniture, bamboo is used to make food, Bamboo is used to make, like the applications of bamboo as a tree are immeasurable, you know, mm. and, and more young people need to come up, you know, the organizations like Kefri, the Bamboo and Rattan Association, uh, which have heavy presence in Kenya. In fact, though it's headquartered in Ethiopia, it has a heavy presence and a huge funding portfolio for, for, for individuals and organizations to engage in building awareness on the propagation of bamboo, on the need for bamboo, on the value addition uh, channels available for bamboo, and other such like trees, you know, that, that build, a, that build a, a, a consensus on, on climate action. In the same light, okay. we've, we've worked with... Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, seems like uh, Robin. Um, <laughs> uh, Snet is having an issue. Are you back? Hi, Dr. Robin. Uh, you had disappeared for a minute. Hi, Dr. Robin. Hello. Sorry, sorry. Hi, my. <laughs> yes. My 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 internet my internet acted up for a bit. Uh, yes. So, but but I was basically just finishing up by saying that um, mm. we we've worked with uh, organization an organization like Unganisha Cultures, which has mm. a lot, which has worked extensively on uh, on countering. You know the trafficking mm. of uh, of of CITES, mm. uh, protected species like uh, the sandalwood, mm. you know, which is used to 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 create perfumes and things like that. Mm. You know, so it's um, we are trying to work downwards to see what an intervention at our local level would look like. Okay. Uh, 
but it's um, it's something we are open to any and all partnerships. I don't know, is is the Vi- Violet Mbiti Foundation willing to uh, t- <laughs> to help us sort throughout this? Yes, 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 yes. Um, as a t- matter of fact, um, mm-hmm. we we do. Uh, like even in the areas of uh, of matters budget advocacy, because like you know, um, while you are presenting, you are also sharing the gaps that you are that you have at the moment. Mm. And uh, in the climate arena, I was th- um, there are very few, not many organizations which are engaging in climate justice mm. and uh, even economic justice. And mainly, um, you find that even if you look at the county governments, like nationally here in Kenya, and even in the other countries, you find that when you look at the Ministry of Environment, where Mm. climate lies in, it's among the least funded. And why is that so? Because there there, there, there are no actors. Yeah. Who are there? There are no actors. There, 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 are, there are few actors who are pushing on policies. So, and yet, you know, like now climate change is real and you can see the way now even funding has increased for climate change globally. And you can see that even in November, uh, Egypt will be hosting the COP27. And uh, it is in these forums, you find that uh, in these global forums, that you find even... Uh, governments are pushing to get more funding towards uh, towards tackling climate, and uh, countries sign commitments. Kenya will also sign a commitment, and they'll expect to get funding for whatever whatever they do. Mm. But now, when it comes to implementation, if there are no players who are engaging the national government as well as the county government. You find that uh, there is no progress whatsoever that is going to be made, because you can see that um, even the U.S. government committed around uh, uh, it's it's committed uh, I think it was billions or something towards uh, towards climate, mm. and the, this money is being sent to organizations, international organizations who now fund Kenya uh, on matters environment. But if now the citizenry are not active, you will find uh, it's just ministers who attend those events from Kenya. Mm. And even the level of awareness is also low. Like how many people know about the COP27 unless you're on social media and uh, mm. you're engaged in this uh, in this uh, climate space, eh? mm. there, there is need for raising awareness on that because it is a very big forum and it is the in thing like right now that uh, that countries are looking at. The, also, the other thing I'd also like to add is uh, you had mentioned that um, with regards to straws, uh mm. moving from straws to to other materials so maybe you can pay a visit to social innovation academy which is in uganda i had gone there they had contracted me to do something for some work for them with the young innovators mm-hmm. they, they they even have an innovation on a, on 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 uh, on on the straws it's no longer plastic so you said social innovation it's called social innovation academy it's called cena oh, okay. oh. yeah it is in in piggy district in uganda so mm. um they have so many innovations around uh, matters climate uh climate change environment so it will be good um, if maybe one day you plan and uh, travel to uganda to go and learn from mm. them because i was there twice and i learned a lot and um, through that connection uh, in, in Uganda, I got an opportunity mm. even to travel to, to Europe, uh, to Eastern Europe, uh, because I also engage in social entrepreneurship. I'm a social entrepreneur. So, and this yeah. all happened because of visiting 
just going there to learn, visiting a, a center, getting to learn and see what uh, you can you can bring on board. So yes, yeah. we've talked about um, the work that you do and. Uh, <coughs> But I know it hasn't been a smooth sailing. So what challenges yes. have you faced? Wow, yeah, okay. Oh my God. Hey. Okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, um, you know, first of all, there's the obvious. I'll start off with the one that, you know, I think, hurt us the most at the beginning and it was the fact that because we are young or we were very young at the time i think when we started anika initiative um i was fresh out of college everybody around me was asking me to stop being dreamy and find a job <laughs> You know, and um, and 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 I think the biggest challenge for us, of uh, particularly in the beginning, has been um, the 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 overall assumption that young people do not have the agency to effect change in their in their in their societies. You know the. The, the assumption that young people have everything to learn but nothing to teach, you know? And, and I found it to be, when I look back now, I feel, I feel like that, that should never be the case. Okay. Um, and also another challenge has been, you know, uh, going through the journey of, of fine-tuning your ideas so that it can respond to people who would want to partner with, with you know, mm. with you. You mm. know, because you have a brilliant idea, but the way you, you represent it, mm. it, it, it doesn't build anybody else's value. Mm. So you find in the beginning you are given a lot of no's. You, you receive so many blank walls, mm. you know, and closed doors. Mm. Until later on, we realized it's a problem of packaging because if you're looking for a partnership, mm. then the best place to start is what can you give the partner, not what you can get from the partner. Most definitely. You, you know, and I think, I think that's something as young people we need to learn. And it's not something you can be taken to school. You have to mm. be willing to put your, how, your heart on a sleeve and get it bruised, have your ideas chewed and spat out, and then come up with more until you are better at it. Okay. You know, and, and I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. But then we've, we've been fortunate to find, to meet people who have held our hands. Mm. Um, in fact, I dare say on this call that our, our, our initiative would be almost nothing mm. were it not for, first of all, God Almighty, Mm -hmm. and the helper who is the helper in the person of a lady called Faith Nafula Wafula Gitonga. Mm. Nafula Wafula is, is, um, is currently a member of our board, mm. but she has been with us from day one. She's currently heading a She's currently having a, a big role at, at an organization, uh, a, an international organization. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's also important to also understand that you need to find people who can hold your hand. Mm. It's very important because otherwise you'll go around in circles. Mm. You know, and then you'll become frustrated. You know, so so there's, uh, there's that obvious challenge. This is the challenge of, uh, you know, being engaged in projects. You know, sometimes over the past few years since we began, we've been implementing major projects. You find a project you're implementing that has a huge budget, but none of that money is a salary. 
you know so mm. you have to be you have to look past uh what it would mean for you to complete that project successfully with the budget that you've been given to do it in minus you having to pay yourself because the other person is coming in as a partner they are willing to pay for everything but because it's a partnership they won't pay you a salary so they will move with you they will pay if you have people coming in consultants they will pay the consultants but then they won't pay you because they are doing a project with you you know and in the beginning those are some of the arrangements you need to be comfortable with you know um but then you see what happens after that is if you do a really really good job the next time you approach other people you have something to say that qualifies you for their help and assistance you know mm. and, and and remuneration on different fronts and so i feel like more than more than a, a list of challenges it has been a story of becoming you know and and and, and we need to get to a point where we view everything uh, that we are engaged in as opportunities to grow mm. yeah so, so i'd say i'd say i'd say that yeah okay okay so um i'd like you now to speak to the to the youth eh? um uh, who are watching uh because you are youth and uh, and uh, you are a source of inspiration that everything is possible so i'd like you now to speak to that youth uh who's watching and uh just share a word of encouragement and motivation as well over to you yeah so to to all the young people who are watching i'd i'd first of all start by saying that it's important for you to know that you're going to be harmed more by the things that you think you know and less by the things that you should be trying to get to know uh it's important for you to approach life with the curiosity of a 4 year old ask as many questions as possible find as many opportunities to learn as possible and more importantly for those of you who believe in god always put god first uh there have been instances in my life where god has answered things i've asked for in a way that i will know by myself only me who will know that it is god who answered it because if i explain it to anybody else they'll think i'm foolish so it's important to always put god first and in the same breath and the same light remain teachable remain teachable and when you recognize great people give them honor you know give them honor um and 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 no person is immune to honor the second you give somebody honor they are more inclined to be destiny helpers and you know people who can hold your hand and and steer you in a direction that can help you but if you do not get anything else from what i've said get these two things number 1 put god first number 2 remain teachable thank you and god bless you <laughs> wow 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 thank you so much uh, dr robin uh even for sparing your time uh to join this uh, this uh, this uh, live broadcast and um I hope I wish you all the best in your endeavors and uh, count on my support because I know that uh, we are going to be engaging here one um when need be uh but um, I'm happy I'm proud of you of uh, the Anika initiative and uh, I wish you all the best so thank you Dr Robin uh Omeka and um, May God continue blessing the works of your hands.
Thank you so much, and I wish you the same. All right. All right. Now, um, so viewer, I want to say thank you for joining this live broadcast today. I hope you've learned a lot from, from Dr. Robin Omeka and the, and the work he's doing uh, at the Anika Initiative. So join me next time, even as I host uh, another guest on this platform. Thank you and God bless.